tonight on CBC Vancouver News. I feel like I've been priced out, like I'm stuck in my apartment. I'm affording my rent because I've been in my place for 11 years. Gloomy forecast. Canada's federal housing agency says home prices will climb in the coming years, while new supply is set to fall. Plus... This is a really difficult, complicated operation. And, uh, you know, it takes a lot of things to go right. But time is ticking to try to rescue the stranded orca calf near Vancouver Island. And... Without tea, you cannot make your day. A welcome meal after a day of fasting. We'll take you inside the kitchen of a local mosque as Ramadan winds down for Muslims. This is CBC Vancouver News. Hello, I'm Dan Burritt. Thanks for joining us. Canada's federal agency tasked with improving housing has a gloomy outlook for the Lower Mainland's already troubled sector. The Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation says house prices will climb over the next two years. At the same time, housing starts are expected to drop because of high interest rates on new construction. Chad Pawson has our top story. Here in one of Vancouver's most desirable neighborhoods, a renovated, move-in ready family home. Now the price tag slightly less than $4 million, but given a slow market over the past two years, it may be a better deal this house than it otherwise could be. At this moment, maybe things seem a little bit more open, like things aren't getting snapped up quite as quickly as they were when the interest rates were lower. It's still really challenging. There's not a lot of inventory in the desirable neighborhoods. Now, if this house doesn't sell quickly, the price could actually increase. That's according to a new Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation report today. It's saying house prices in Vancouver are expected to rise, get back to the peak where they were at two years ago. That's because buyers are expecting mortgage rates to drop so demand is increasing a little bit of positive momentum in that people are expecting rates to come down later this year so buyers are saying okay now's our time to get in let's go on a variable rate mortgage we'll take advantage of the lower rates as they unfold here in vancouver's west end rentals are numerous but the news isn't much better according to the cmhc rents are set to increase vacancy rates set to decrease also all tied to a lack of supply and even an increase in population to the region now I feel like I've been priced out, like I'm stuck in my apartment, I can't move out anymore. I'm affording my rent because I've been in my place for 11 years, so I'm protected under the tenancy rental um, cap that the government provides. The government should do something. But wait, hasn't the provincial government and the federal government been busy building rental housing? Yes, they have, with announcements almost weekly. But the CMHC says that supply is nowhere near to ready to keep up with demand. The provincial government, however, is more optimistic. We are confident, though, that we will surpass targets, given that we are taking steps to unlock small-scale multi-units, unlock transit-oriented development, uh, and I do believe that BC will continue to lead the country in housing starts. So, what to do? Well, if you're looking to buy, the CMHC says look to Metro Vancouver's suburbs. That's where new builds that are affordable and available are set to come online over the next couple of years. As for rentals, well, hang on to what you have and hope that government-led rental building projects like this one come available fast. Chad Pawson, CBC News, Vancouver. The City of Vancouver and the Park Board say they have now finished a planned cleanup of Crab Park's designated sheltering area and people who have been asked to move out can return. But some residents say they've been told the move may have to wait one more day and that's leaving many frustrated. It's just a lot less than they keep saying. And they keep building it up and then we keep, you know, biting and then hook, line, sinker, so it's not what we expected. The board says it has removed makeshift structures, over 20 propane tanks, six generators, and resurfaced the area with gravel. It's also created 27 sheltering sites for the 27 people it says had been regularly staying in the park and given them tents. But one housing advocate says the number of people allowed to use that space is actually being reduced. I've just heard today that it's down to 18. So this is a very clear eviction by attrition. It's absolutely 100% clear that the intention is to shut this camp as soon as possible by limiting people. The city and board argue the cleanup was necessary because the site had become unsafe and unhygienic. 
A leaked memo from a hospital in BC's Northern Health Region has sparked questions about the safety of healthcare workers. The memo from last year tells nurses not to take away illicit drugs or weapons from patients. The official opposition, uh, opposition suggests decriminalization has led to drug use in hospital rooms. As Mayor Baines reports, the Premier is trying to clarify the rules around hospitals and drugs. A leaked memo sent out to staff at a Quinnell hospital last July asked them not to search through patients' personal belongings and take away substances. BC United MLA Eleanor Sterko highlighted the issue in the legislature. Nurses face a daily reality of drug-fueled violence, from having drug smoke purposely blown in their faces to being kicked, punched, shoved and even stabbed. The Northern Health memo also tells staff not to restrict visitors if they suspect they're dropping off illicit substances and also not to confiscate weapons if they're found. The memo came a few months after the possession of small amounts of certain drugs were decriminalized in the province under a three-year pilot project. Premier David Eby says more security has been added to hospitals and clarified the policy. We partnered with the nurses' union on providing additional security in hospitals. Uh, and just to be totally clear, you're not allowed to smoke in the hospitals. You're not allowed to vape in the hospitals. You're not allowed to have weapons in the hospital. The president of the BC Nurses Union says there are safety concerns and they should be addressed by security. Nurses should not be required to remove weapons from patients if they do not want to surrender them. Um, and so that is the role of security or law enforcement. The Nurses Union says it supports harm reduction and if hospitals are permitting drug use in certain areas, there should be more supervised consumption sites located within acute care settings. Mira Baines, CBC News, Victoria. Supervised consumption sites have become a contentious topic in parts of BC. In February, hundreds of people protested outside Richmond City Hall after the city said it was considering the possibility of one. And the BC Conservatives have claimed these sites will bring, quote, crime and chaos. Our Joe Ballard got a look inside a supervised consumption site and learned more about how they work. Supervised consumption sites aren't new. In fact, the first one in North America opened in Vancouver more than 20 years ago. Yet for many, they're still a little mysterious. What happens inside and how does it work? Well, it's been a while since we've been granted access inside of a supervised consumption site. So we've come to Surrey to take a tour. Great to meet you. Nice to meet you, Joel. Aaron. All right, so we are out front of Safe Point here in Surrey. Let's start with the easy question first. What is Safe Point? Yeah, so Safe Point is a supervised consumption site uh, that opened in 2017 uh, to witness consumption of substances. It's a federally exempted site. So folks would come up here and they would buzz in and, um, but I have a card, so yeah, we'll come we on go. in, yeah. She says more than 170 people access this supervised consumption site a day. So they arrive, um, they give a, a unique uh, identifier. Um, some people might call it a handle, um, but then it will pull up a bit of information about them. It's completely anonymous and not connected to any other health um, care services. Respond emergency, overdose. In 2016, the overdose crisis prompted the province to declare a public health emergency. Since then, the BC Coroner's Service says more than 13,000 have died. At Safe Point, Gibson says people can access free harm reduction supplies, like needles, syringes and pipes, among other things, to ensure the equipment they're using is clean. For privacy reasons, Fraser Health let us tour the facility before it opened to the public for the day. All right, should we check it out? Yeah, come on okay. in. This is the consumption area. Individual booths line a wall, where Gibson says people can consume their drugs under the supervision of trained healthcare professionals. What's the benefit of having staff right here while this is happening? Yeah, so the staff, they can sit here, but they're often um, connecting with people and chatting with them in a more intimate kind of uh, conversation. Um, they're here to um, be supportive, caring witnesses who are trained um, to be readily respond in the event that uh, people uh, start to have a toxic drug poisoning event. Since this site opened in 2017, Fraser Health says staff have reversed more than 3,000 overdoses. 
and over the last half of a year, there's been an average of about nine overdoses a month. Gibson says it varies with the toxicity of the street supply. Why does a, a site like this matter? Harm reduction um, provides a, a place for people um, to be to connect and be cared for. Substance use uh, remains one of the most highly stigmatized um, uh, things in community, and so people will often uh, they will isolate and they use alone, and then that's when we see adverse outcomes, and we continue to see the high rates of overdose death. One of the big concerns that we often hear around consumption sites, especially because for a lot of the public there might be a little bit of mystery around it, is, oh, people are getting free drugs at these sites. Does that happen here? Yeah, so people bring their own previously procured substances um, and they bring them here to use um, under uh, trained witnesses. People do not buy or receive illegal drugs at a safe consumption site. However, Gibson says they can test their drugs to ensure they aren't tainted. And while here, she adds that people can also be connected to other services, like addiction clinics, shelter spaces, and basic wound care. Fraser Health says through SafePoint, more than 580 people have accepted referrals to other healthcare providers and social services. Supervised injection is just one of the services here. This area is an inhalation site. So we've really seen an increase in the amount of um, inhalation use over the last uh, five to seven years. Um, and uh, I think that that's sort of a testament to the change in the drug supply. And Has inhalation become more popular than injection at this point? I would say so, yeah. 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 Um, and I guess what are the, the challenges of, of now also dealing with um, this boost in in inhalation compared to just injection. It's hard to find spaces that are appropriate uh, for uh, witness inhalation um, in terms of uh, they're also outside often and so it makes it really difficult for some of the other parts of the province to um, have spaces that are accessible especially when you're dealing with minus 30. The Safe Point supervised consumption site sits in Surrey's Wally neighborhood surrounded by community centers, a park, and homes. Whenever consumption sites open, we often see that there's um, some, some resistance, of course, from the community. Um, what makes a community a good area for a consumption site versus another part of the community? I think any place where you're seeing levels of unregulated toxic drug poisoning events is a good place to have it. It's understandable that communities um, have a lot of questions, so they're here to enhance safety, uh, reduce the public consumption of substances, um, connect people to services, build and be a part of building an inclusive community. Yeah, there's often lots of concern that opening a supervised consumption site like this or an overdose prevention site is going to increase public drug use in the area. Um, does that happen? What we know from the evidence and the research is that it actually can reduce uh, public disorder, public consumption, uh, and reduce um, uh, impact or reduce calls for service for police and, and fire. Since opening, she says there's been a reduction in the number of public overdoses within a 500 meter radius of the site, and there's never been an overdose death at Safe Point. What does the future look like for supervised consumption sites, at least within Fraser Health? We're looking to um, provide equitable regional access to witness consumption services as a standard part of, of health care. Uh, in all of our communities, it's an important, it's an important life-saving service. But for now, Safe Point remains the only federally exempted site in the entire Fraser Health region. Joel Ballard, CBC News, Surrey. Atira Women's Resource Society, the largest housing operator in BC, has a new CEO. Former Vancouver Park Board General Manager Donnie Rosa will head the agency starting April 22nd. Rosa spoke with Gloria Makarenko on CBC Radio's On the Coast. There's no better place to see community working together for great results. I think that'll be the approach and those are the lessons I'll bring with me into this leadership role. Rosa takes the helm of Atira nearly a year after it was rocked by a conflict of interest scandal. Former CEO Janice Abbott resigned last May after a damning audit found conflict of interest in violations involving her husband, the former head of BC Housing. 
If you're thinking about challenging a poorly written speeding ticket, you may not have the success you're hoping for. The BC Court of Appeal weighed in this week on a commonly held myth that missing information on a ticket will mean the fee is automatically thrown out. The CBC's Leanne Young spoke with Jason Proctor about what actually happened. So this all comes down to one man's speeding ticket. Like, walk us through the case, what happened? Well, exactly. This is this legal odyssey that kind of begins by the side of the road in Abbotsford in May 2021, when this guy, Kevin Robinson, is pulled over and handed a uh, $121 ticket for uh, going 97 in a 60 zone. And so he goes to provincial court with a ticket, and what the ticket says is he was fined for disobeying a traffic control device. But he points out, well, the ticket didn't say what device he disobeyed. You know, it could have been a sign, could have been a marker, could have been a line. And so, actually, at the provincial court level, he loses. He decides to go the next level to BC Supreme Court, where actually the judge looks and says, yeah, the legislation says you have to be given sort of reasonable understanding of what you're accused of. The ticket's, you know, a little vague in terms of this traffic uh, obeying uh, sign uh, wording. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, they, uh, you know, quash the ticket. So then the Crown appeals and takes this. This is BC's top court, and they weighed in it, and it this week, and they say, well, actually, you know what? You have to look at not just the wording, but kind of the entirety of what happened. And in this case, the police officer said, well, I told him you were disobeying a traffic sign that said you had to go 60 uh, kilometers an hour. Mm. And so the, the appeal court says, you know, just a little mistake like that. Like, it, it's just not enough. You have to consider the entirety of it. So I think this is really going to crush the hopes of a lot of you who are armchair lawyers who think that a minor offense can get their ticket thrown out. Well, yeah, and that's actually somewhat what the Court of Appeal says is also actually that the courts have the ability to amend tickets to fix kind of mistakes as long as they're not super prejudicial to the person charged uh, before trial. But there is this idea, and I think it comes actually from the U.S. legal system where they're really picky about the wording. Mm. Uh, but, you know, bottom line, if you get a ticket and you're sort of going to run in there and go, ah, it doesn't say exactly this, you might not be so uh, lucky. In Dang. Okay, so just pay the ticket or just, you know, drive safely. Drive safely. Maybe, maybe <laughs> stick to the speed limit. Yes, exactly. All right. Thanks for that, Jason Proctor, for us. The province says it is setting up a dedicated wildfire training and education centre at Thompson Rivers University in Kamloops. The Premier calls it an important step for, prepa for preparing firefighters of the future. In the last three years, we've seen two of the worst forest fire seasons our province has ever seen. And the trend is clear uh, and profoundly concerning right now. Uh, the snowpack is much lower than normal. Many parts of our province uh, at the highest level of drought. Um, and uh, the fire threat is very profound. The program comes after recommendations from a provincial task force that's finding ways to support people during emergencies. EB says it's the first program of its kind in North America. Classes are set to begin next year. We're learning more about the 11-year-old boy from B.C. who was killed in a dog attack in Alberta earlier this week. Kendra Wong tells CBC News her son, Cash, was creative, polite and gentle. Cash, who lived in B.C. and was in grade 5, was in Edmonton visiting his father who lived with a roommate. He was inside a South Edmonton home when he was attacked by the roommate's two large dogs. Wong says it doesn't feel real that she won't see her son again. We had plans to travel the world. The day he got out of grade 12, he said, Mom, will you come with me if we buy the... He's like, no, i got to finish this school year out. I like my school. I like my new friends. I was like, all right. <laughs> yeah, he was my world. That's 100%. We did everything together. Wong says she was told the dogs are Cane Corso breed. Edmonton police say the animals are in care as it investigates. Time is ticking to try to rescue an orphan orca calf stuck in a lagoon on the edge of Vancouver Island. Its mother died in that shallow water almost two weeks ago. As Karis Hogg reports, while the calf seems to be in relatively good shape, there is now a sense of urgency to get it out of there. This young orca, named Quisa Hayes, good hunter, has been stranded here ever since its mother died. Ihadasat and Nuchalnath First Nations, along with the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, have been working together trying to coax the calf out of the lagoon to join its family pod. But so far, they haven't been successful. 
the rescue team isn't giving up, vowing to find another way. I think there, there's going to be three or four stages related to capturing it. Um, some that we already practiced with um, acoustics. They say a helicopter and a sling is one option, but it's not their first choice. We're looking at other options as well in terms of using um, a sling onto a, a, a vehicle and then uh, moving the animal that way to either a landing craft or a vessel. The Ahadisat people have deep cultural and spiritual connections to killer whales, and the nation has been receiving calls of concern and support from around the world. Many well wishes for a young whale in hopes one day it will be free. Daily monitoring seems to indicate the calf is healthy, but Paul Cottrell with the DFO says time is not on their side. We're looking to uh, rescue the animal and then move it from its current area closer to where um, its pod hopefully will pass by in a, in a net pen. A tense moment in a community known for its tranquility. Karis Hogg, CBC News, Vancouver. Darius Madavi, our science and climate expert, joins us now with a first look at the weather. We heard the Premier talking about wildfire preparedness, training firefighters for the future, and you have an update on that. Yes, uh, we've got uh, that, that wildfire that was listed as out of control uh, earlier this week uh, in Merritt. Oh. What happened there? Uh, earlier this week in Merritt, uh, just just west of Merritt, uh, we we have that now uh, is listed as under control, so not just being held, but under control, which is uh, great news. And uh, if we're looking for what's happening in the rest of the wildfire season, again, we should be looking at the snowpack because other than seasonal forecasts that aren't the most reliable, this is our best bet. And uh, unfortunately, we have uh, had a the end of the March was quite dry for uh, northern parts of BC, especially these locations where they had uh, the second to fourth uh, driest March on record due to those last two weeks just being exceptionally dry, even though we had an unsettled start to the to the month. Uh, so as a result, we have seen again a worsening in drought, situ uh, the snowpack situation back to being uh, a third below normal, 33%. Uh, we had been improving a little bit earlier this month. You can see we were a little bit heading out of the red, but we are now back to uh, nearly the worst year on record. Now, that could change. We are seeing some more snow can come to many areas, and we do have some more on the way this weekend, particularly for parts of the southeast. This is frozen for some reason, uh, but if we turn to here in Vancouver, a sunny day tomorrow, so don't expect any uh, precipitation here. Okay, thanks very much. We'll check in later. Thanks, Thank Darius. The month of Ramadan is coming to an end in a few days for Muslims. Since it began, volunteers have been working to make sure a meal is provided for free to all those who need it when breaking their fast at sunset. As the CBC's Zara Premji explains, the need has grown over the years as more newcomers turn to Canada as a safe haven. The sun is soon to set, and that means the first sip of water and bite of food after several hours of fasting for many Muslims observing Ramadan across the world. Here at Al-Masjid al-Jamia, the work has started well in advance, and it's going on for the entire month of Ramadan. All right, so food is obviously key in iftar. Everyone's been fasting all day, so let's check in with the volunteers that have been preparing this food while also fasting. No, I'm making a very special drink. This is for very special drink for only Ramadan. This drink is very famous here. You like it. It's a famous Pakistani drink. It is... Yeah. Paija. See here, the color is changed now. We are all thirsty right now. So I'm putting the hair. But facing that thirst while fasting and preparing to feed hundreds, the ultimate sacrifice. Me, 11 month, I'm a laziest person in my house. My wife complained, you are asleep all the time. Somebody grab this. But for one month of the year, Karam says he's completely dedicated to this masjid and the hundreds coming through the doors for iftar. All of this food, all of the preparation done as an act of service. Everyone has a hand in it. So, 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 it, so when you eat that piece of fruit, somebody put it there. When, uh, when, you're, when you're drinking the chai, somebody took the time to, to make sure that the right balance of milk and tea and sugar. And it has a cardamom, milk, sugar. It helps to boost your energy. After the Ramadan, you're a little bit dimmed. So after your meal, you need a little bit energized. 
for praying. We make it almost 300 cups for everybody. Uh, without tea, you cannot make your day. Those 300 plus cups, along with the food you see here, feeding those who need it most. The number used to be in the 200, 250 range was sort of the average and it seemed like a lot of people then, but now it's amped up to a higher number due to the fact that we have a lot of newcomers, we have a lot of refugees. We feel so good whenever we come here because we are Muslim so we have to break our fast and in, whenever we come here, we, they, really, they are really good, they, their hospitality is also so good. Now the fruit, the chai and the sherbet you just saw, that's just the beginning. Oh, my favorite. <laughs> oh, you're in for a treat today, guys. Yeah, it's a big treat today. It is treat. But first, prayer. <laughs> and then the meal. <laughs> and then some more prayer. <laughs> Giving thanks for the ability to share in a free meal prepared by dozens of generous volunteers. We are like a family. Without love, you know, the, uh, the, there's really nothing. And there's a lot of love in this place. Zara Premji, CBC News, Vancouver. It was one of the largest non-nuclear explosions, and it happened right here in B.C. After the break, we take you back to the 1958 blast at Ripple Rock. Thanks for staying with us during our commercial-free live stream tonight. Fast food chains constantly try out new dishes to try to get more of you into their stores. Paula Duhacek takes us inside one test kitchen where some chefs are trying something new. Everything that ends up on the A&W menu starts right here. The toasted bun, we have our piri piri aioli. This kitchen, a battlefield in the fast food wars. Companies duking it out to come up with the next viral sensation. The next Crunchwrap Supreme, Grimace Milkshake, or Pumpkin Spice Latte. How important is it to have these new menu items to hang on to your existing customers and to find new ones? Um, I would say extremely important. If you look at our journey between 1956 and Winnipeg to today, the menu doesn't look the same. We are all fighting for that same guest and the new exciting menu items help them to come to the top top of mind for, you know what, like, is doing that new burger, I want to go and try it. At a and the latest creation is a Puri Puri burger. It starts with a bun, a new spicy sauce, instead of a beef patty, adds a hash brown. It's based on a menu hack, cooked up by South Asian Canadians. I'm from India and there's a big, big population of vegetarian folks there. Shifting demographics are a key part of why restaurants mix up their menus in the first place. Customers are changing, so are their palates. And these days, burger chains aren't just competing with other burger chains. It's the smaller operators and even some of the independents who are growing. And they tend to serve more globally inspired cuisine now with the economic situation. So if the brands want to grow, they're going to have to steal customers. Next up from a very different part of the world, this is a Moroccan hot pepper aioli. Mm. It takes anywhere from a few weeks to several years to come up with a new menu item. The final product has to taste good and come out the same way every time. There's just a difference between the way I can whisk up a sauce and a, a gigantic machine that's making literally hundreds and hundreds and thousands of liters of this. It needs to work in those very, very tough kitchen environments. Time-consuming work, but experts say there's more of it happening. Many test kitchens closed during the pandemic, and restaurants trim their menus to save money. But these days... That wave of innovation is flooding back into the market right now. So it's certainly busier now than it has been in five years. For its part, a and has more Vancouver.
It is Throwback Thursday, where we plunge deep into our vast CBC archives. 66 years ago, the Ripple Rock explosion took place in Seymour Narrows near Campbell River. That planned blast was carried out to cut the danger to mariners posed by an underwater mountain. And the explosion was broadcast live on CBC News. This funny-looking place we're in is our bunker. You can see it's pretty well constructed. And as you can also see, it's just about as full of people as it can po pro possibly be. Down at the far end, the CBC uh, radio commentators, uh, film cameramen by the score, uh, then our colleague from the French uh, network, uh, Bill and I, and just over here, uh, the two cameras. Of course, you can't see the camera that's taking the pictures, but there's the other one. And out on its snout, that great long snorkel that sticks out there is a 25-inch lens, and that'll pretty well put uh, Ripple Rock right smack in the middle of your living room when it goes up or out or sideways or whatever it's going to do in two minutes and 15 seconds right now. How about the countdown, Ted? Well, the countdown, Bill, will be your baby. 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. That was the end of Ripple Rock, one of the largest non-nuclear planned explosions of its time. Here to tell us more about it is Sandra Parrish, Executive Director of the Campbell River Museum. Sandra, thanks for joining us, first of all. Oh, you're, you're welcome. Tell us, why was Ripple Rock so dangerous? Well, you know, at, uh, it was a large under, uh, underground, underwater mountain, and at low tide, the top peak was only about nine feet below the water. So you can imagine this was a very narrow passage. Uh, there was a lot of um, whirlpools and all sorts of things. So it would be an easy thing to end up hitting it. And a lot of vessels did. So it was quite treacherous. Uh, do we have any sense of how many people were killed or, or, or drowned by it? Well, I mean, it's, it's, hard, to, it's hard to know, but, but we, the, the number of 114 within our knowledge mm -hmm. is, is commonly used, yeah, yeah. That's a lot of lives. Why was it's blowing- a lot of lives. Yeah. Uh, why was blowing it up considered a, a marvel of engineering? Well, at the time, um, there was uh, there was you know a, a number of different engineers and mining companies that were involved in it, and they had to develop a specific um, drill to use in those sort of circumstances. It was a, quite a massive tunnel all under all under the seabed, uh, and they just really did not know how much what the impact was going to be. So, quite a feat. Uh, we're, I mean, we're looking at some of this footage again. It is immense how, how big this blast was. Um, and one of the commentators said, well, we're in this sturdy frame wood, uh, I guess, <laughs> protective cover. What did planners do to keep people safe? Because that is an amazing blast. Oh, well, you know, it was one of those things where the, ta the, the town was very small at that time, of course, uh, and people were frightened. You know, people took their china off their shelves and boarded up their windows, and there was people that gathered in homes to watch it live. There was even a group that went over to, I believe, April Point, where they, which was the closest they could get to it, to view it. But then when it happened, there was not a single thing felt in town. Yeah. It was like the big event that wasn't an event uh, in, in terms of what they were cons uh, felt, but nobody knew what the, the impact was going to be. Mm -hmm. And you can hear that in that commentator's yeah. voice. <laughs> they're in that, they're in that uh, 
bunker thing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure if he's going to make it through or not. <laughs> well, and when considering how much, how much, how many, how much explosive and, and and how much rock they actually had to move, uh, is it? Mm -hmm. And tell us about at, now that it was after it was destroyed. What did that do for the for the for the passage of vessels around Seymour Narrows? Well, it certainly did make it a much safer passage. Uh, the top is uh, down about. Uh, 42 feet on a, a low tide. So that's nice and safe. But it is still very, you know, very much a, a treacherous body of water. You know, you have to choose your, your time to go through there and uh, choose just the right tides. And, and of course, uh, in about 19, I think it was 1985, that we had that um, cruise ship, the Sundancer, that mm. just sort of scuffed the edge of it and um, was maybe the one of the, the more recent victims mm -hmm. of Ripple Rock. Well, we're glad, mm -hmm. hopefully, there are not any more. Sandra Parrish, Executive Director of the Campbell River Museum, we appreciate your time and your insight. Thanks for joining us. You're welcome. Have a good day. Rescue crews in Taiwan say the number of people stranded after yesterday's powerful earthquake is now in the hundreds. More on the rescue missions after the break. younger people who want to have that physical something. Maybe they don't even have the means to play it. Maybe there's a little bit of nostalgia going on. We sell maybe a few dozen a month. Oof. Big numbers, right? But compared to what that was for several years, that's huge. There are a couple new companies out that are selling their own variation of a portable player. And people are buying these up. One of the reasons is for that TV show, Stranger Things. So it brings back that nostalgia and they have, and they have tapes, they have Walkmans, boom boxes, and then people see that, oh, this is kind of cool, we'll go look for some of these. A lot of smaller upcoming bands have embraced the cassette format which is great to see. Local acts, acts that come through touring. They're easy to move around, right? And I imagine they'd be significantly cheaper to press than, than vinyl. Hi, I'm Emily. I'm Adam. I'm Will. I'm Cole. We are Baloney, Colorado. <laughs> So I had a, an old Astro van that I was driving around for a couple of years, and it only had a cassette player in it. The radio didn't work, so we went to Value Village and bought a, you know, a ton of, <laughs> a ton of cassettes. <laughs> uh, personal favorites: Ray Charles, Jerry Lee Lewis, those sort of things. So when, every time we were on our way to a gig, we'd blast those on on cassette in the van. So when we were making our own music, we said, "Oh, you know, we got to get cassettes because this is kind of what we're listening to and and you know, going to gigs with and stuff." Um, merch is definitely where most of the money's at for us at this level, anyways. So. Any physical copy of music selling is, is a win. My business director and I, we started three years ago. He sent me a news article on the cassette tape resurgence. So I laughed a little bit. I checked it out. So I came back to him and I thought, okay, yeah, this is awesome. It just brought the nostalgia back and I, we noticed that there was a market for this with bands releasing uh, music on cassette tape during the pandemic and we just dived in. The demographics go anywhere from about 17, 18 years old to 45, 50. So then you have your tape collectors that are in their late 30s, 40s. But then the younger generation, they're seeing this and they might have seen tapes when they were growing up. But that depends on when they were born, whether it was late 80s or early 90s. And then they see them again and they thought, oh, I, I didn't know that people still made these. So they see that and that kind of attracts them to it, especially if they're in a band. We've had a couple of people that have that said they're super cool. We've had people that have gotten us to sign them. It's, it's kind of one of those things that I think a lot of people like just having something physical from the band, not so much for the music aspect, but just for the, you know, kind of idea of a souvenir or something from the show.
In Taiwan, hundreds of people are now believed to be trapped after yesterday's power, Wednesday's powerful earthquake, many of them in the mountains. Here's Cameron McIntosh on the challenging attempts to get them to safety. At this temporary medical station, dozens of rescued tourists tended to. This woman, one of many here, out hiking when the quake hit. The night was terrible, terrible heavy with aftershocks and tremors and rocks falling every few minutes. Through the day, rescue crews focused on the rugged and mountainous terrain of the sprawling county of Walian, near the quake's epicenter off Taiwan's east coast. It's estimated hundreds were still stranded Thursday. Aftershocks and rock slides slowing access in many areas, like this trail leading to a quarry where these miners were stranded, rescued later by helicopter. Rocks were like bullets coming from above, says this miner. Some people have been found unconscious or with serious injuries. The Taiwanese government says three Canadian tourists were rescued in a national park. At this hostel, owners say some guests remain missing. So we both very worried about our, our guests. In the aftermath, more evidence of how violent that magnitude 7.4 quake was. Cracked walls, bouncing bridges, a shaking hospital where nurses huddled newborns together. In Walian City, that tilted building, symbolic of the disaster, is being pulled down. Inside, a body of a woman was found who ran back in to get her cat. But most buildings, while damaged, still stand. Taiwan is built to withstand earthquakes. Still, the first big one in 25 years has people rattled. With many now thinking about the next one, but for now, the focus remains on rescue and recovery. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. U.S. President Joe Biden is telling Israel's prime minister to take steps to protect civilians and aid workers in Gaza or risk losing support for the Israeli offensive. The U.S. has been Israel's staunchest ally for decades. But as Chris Reyes explains, both are dealing with international pressure after the recent airstrike that killed seven aid workers in Gaza. The president felt strongly that it was time to, to talk to Prime Minister Netanyahu about his concerns. That conversation happened over the phone, lasted 30 minutes, and was a direct result of Monday's Israeli airstrike that killed seven aid workers delivering food with the charity World Central Kitchen. The message from President Biden to the Israeli Prime Minister, protect civilians and aid workers in Gaza and move on an immediate ceasefire to allow supplies into the enclave and the release of hostages. The president made it clear that our policies with respect to Gaza uh, will be dependent upon our assessment of how well the Israelis uh, make changes and implement changes uh, to, to make the situation in Gaza better for the Palestinian people. The Biden administration has not made clear what those policy changes will be, but Secretary of State Antony Blinken appeared confident Israel will deliver on the changes. It's uh, our expectation that um, Israel uh, will and certainly should announce concrete, specific, measurable steps that uh, it will take and take as soon as possible uh, to make sure that there can be an effective surge in assistance, that it can be sustained, uh, and that humanitarian workers and civilians are better protected. Go, go, go. Pressure on Israel to change course in Gaza is mounting almost six months into the conflict as the civilian death toll rises and the enclave's population teeters on the brink of famine. In the UK, 600 lawyers and academics have sent a letter to their prime minister demanding the British government stop arming Israel. From the family of the aid workers killed on Monday, outrage. If it was a terrible mistake, then the Israeli military is extremely incompetent. From other aid workers, frustration that they can't do their jobs when it's needed most. We have been saying it for weeks now. This pattern of attacks is either intentional or indicative of reckless incompetence. Israel maintains Monday's attack on aid workers was a mistake, but has yet to respond to U.S. demands on policy changes. Chris Reyes, CBC News, New York. 
just before 6.44. Here's a live look at the Jacques Cartier Bridge heading toward Montreal. Up next, a spring storm that's caused power outages in homes and schools across that province and beyond. Stick around. When I first found out about the exam, I had no idea that nobody had taken it before. Um, but then when I started working on it more, I found out nobody had. So I thought it was a huge opportunity for me and I really pushed myself and it was a great honor. I got to work with Melissa Wallace, my dance teacher, and we got to choreograph uh, around three to four exercises, like a choreographed entrance, a port de bras and a dodge, and a koto, which is fancy turns. And then I also got to perform a variation from the Sleeping Beauty, as well as a Spanish variation. Overall, it was just actually a great achievement to have. Um, now I am working on furthering my teaching credentials and hoping that I can inspire younger dancers to work towards this exam. I remember showing them pictures from the day of and they just kept having me go back and look through them all with them and explain everything behind it. They were very excited for me. April showers took a backseat to heavy snow and strong wind today in parts of Quebec and Ontario. And as the CBC's Sarah Levitt explains, the spring storm caused widespread power outages. It may officially be spring, but winter is having the last laugh. Snow has been walloping southern Quebec and parts of Ontario since early Thursday morning, and it's moving eastward. Wet, heavy, and unforgiving. I felt pretty depressed, honestly. Uh, yesterday, there was flowers and today it's under a foot of snow, so. I had to go back into my closet and fish out all my stuff. Uh, I almost wore my spring coat and I'm glad I didn't. Up to 25 centimeters of snow is expected to fall in parts of southern Quebec and New Brunswick with wind gusts up to 70 kilometers per hour. Hundreds of schools closed due to the conditions, the dense snow clinging to trees and power lines. By noon, 250,000 households were without power in Quebec. 
the snow is essentially three to six times more heavy than usually it would be. So it, it has an impact on trees, of course. Uh, branches have broken or falling on our network, causing outages. In Montreal and Ottawa, another concern. I wish I didn't change my winter tires uh, on Sunday. That was definitely a mistake. Road conditions slushy and slippy. Everyone will have to be patient because we will need 8 to 12 hours to come back doing the turn around the network. We have to plow the snow away from 10,000 kilometers, 6,000 kilometers of sidewalks and 4,000 kilometers of streets. After a particularly mild winter, this storm feels unexpected, but... In the first half of April, don't be surprised, it doesn't happen every year. In the second half of April, it's more exceptional. And at the beginning of May, it's like near records or like we're, it's really extreme. Some people took advantage of the snowfall. The skier says the conditions are sick. As the storm heads east, New Brunswick and Cape Breton should see heavier snowfall into Friday, but there is a silver lining. The white stuff isn't expected to stay on the ground long. Sarah Levitt, CBC News. Montreal. But how long will it stay on the ground? That's when we turn to the scientist Darius Madavi, who's going to tell us about BC, but check in with Quebec and Ontario first. Uh, not sticking around long, especially mm -hmm. Montreal. I mean, Montreal got 25 centimeters of snow, but in the next couple of days, temperatures going up to 15 degrees, so it's not going to stick around for too long. Maybe those higher elevations, uh, maybe a bit of relief in terms of snowpack for the coming wildfire season, maybe a bit of a delay there, so that might be good news. Uh, but I just want to show this storm's progression because it is very well defined. It looks very nice. You can see uh, that swirling there, that development of the storm, and then you can see it's really coming all through the U.S. It was a really nasty storm. Uh, we, we saw many injuries, a lot of property damage being done, and then it started to lose a little bit of steam as it came up to Canada, fortunately. Uh, we saw some heavy snow around parts of Quebec, and now that is heading over to the Maritimes, where they're getting uh, dumped on quite heavily right now, especially in places like, uh, like New Brunswick. Um, uh, our editor Jill showed me a photo that her mom took of her uh, car just covered in snow, so as early as this morning, and now it's been continuing since then, so lots of snow still there, and uh, you can see spreading across, and then some rain coming to parts of uh, Nova Scotia as well, especially around Halifax. But fortunately, the next 36 hours or so, it should start to clear out. New Brunswick already uh, losing some of that snow. So a little bit of good news there as things start to calm down a little bit, although temperatures in the Maritimes will remain a little bit lower for a few days. But let's turn our attention to here in BC, where nothing so dramatic is happening. We do have some precipitation coming, including some for the lower mainland that was uh, a little bit unexpected. Uh, it was originally supposed to just be some sunny with a few clouds uh, days, but now it looks like it will be at least a little bit uh, uh, rainy at some times. Saturday looking mostly dry. If we go here to zooming into the south coast, you can see uh, Friday, beautiful sunny day. By the time we get into Saturday, we see that cloud move in early in the morning, but mostly dry. Sunday, we may see a few showers and as early as Saturday as well. But hopefully by Sunday afternoon, for those who are hoping for a little bit of sun, we should see the, uh, the cloud clear out a little bit for a, what might be a, a sunnier afternoon. So some of the models still have that in. So maybe if you're uh, hoping for some sun, we've got good news for everybody. That would be ideal. Temperatures, though, staying a little bit lower than seasonal over the next couple days after tomorrow uh, because of those, those conditions. And if we turn it to our uh, conditions across the province, relatively calm beside that little bit of precipitation in the southeast tomorrow. In terms of Vancouver, once again, a little bit of a cloudy weekend, mm -hmm. but, you know, can't complain. April showers and all that, right? We need those April showers. Thanks, buddy. Thanks, Dan. Coming up, how two women who have been friends for 20 years found out they're actually related. Their stories are next. I wanna throw it all away 
Imagine wanting to find out a bit more about your family history. So you do a little research, perhaps online, even take a DNA test, just to find out that your best friend of two decades is actually your half-sister. Well, that actually happened, Dan. No. And to Paula Blanchard and Heather Barker, and they shared their story with Gloria Makarenko on CBC Radio's On the Coast. Take a look. I always had this feeling I needed to know who my biological father was. It took many years, and I guess eventually DNA, the 23andMe and Ancestry became available. So I thought, I'm going to give it a go. So I had met her um, through a mutual friend, and then we just started becoming very close through the years. Some of the things that we did seemed to be very similar in nature and I guess some people caught on to that and we just kind of chuckled about it and just thought okay you know that's just the way we are right my mom had saying, said the name Rick but she couldn't give me any further details so my uncle all of a sudden remembered when I said Barker he goes oh Rick Barker right that's that poor young man that your mom grandma chased away down the stairs with a frying pan when your mom was pregnant so I was like oh that must be my dad then I seen that the, the grandkids he, names okay <laughs> and the grandkids' names reflected Heather's kids. Right. So I was like, I, w I walked up, and I, I remember going into the washroom, and I came out, and I was yelling, oh, my God, it's Heather, it's Heather, Heather. And everybody's looking at me like, what are you talking about? I said, Heather's my sister. And my husband's like, what? What are you talking about? I'm like, Rick and Heather. Heather's my sister. I had messaged her, call me ASAP. And I said, who's your dad, Heather? And she's like, Rick Barker. And then all of a sudden I heard. <laughs> well, I can't say that on air, but I was just in shock. Like, what is happening? Like, I don't believe this. This is are like, you punking unbelievable. Me? So... 
Yeah, it was quite a shock. My dad would have been over the moon happy to find out he had another daughter. For some people, they're okay with maybe not moving forward. But for me, I always felt like I needed to know. I hit the jackpot. I don't think it could have turned out any better. That's awesome. Did turn out nicely, thankfully. It'd be a bit of a surprise. Hey, text me, call me. <laughs> We're related. What? Yeah, no, how, mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you tell them? That's, I, yeah. Over a nice meal? Coffee? I'm not sure. I have a more Thanks for coffee. coming over. Yeah, we're, you're in the wheel now. Mm, okay. Mm. Thanks for being with us tonight on CBC Vancouver News at 6. You can watch this newscast on CBC Gem, our free app, as well as on YouTube and our website, cbc.ca slash bc. And we will have your next local news at 11 o'clock right after the National. See you then.